Okay, so good morning. So let's uh, continue what we are doing. So let me just remind uh, where we are. So we start uh, uh, putting an operator pro expansion for uh, a scaling field. And the idea is that if we are able to classify all possible uh, realization of this uh, kind of algebra, this is an operator pro expansion algebra, uh, we, uh, we can control uh, all possible critical phenomena. So from uh, this point of view means that we have to find an infinite number of uh, uh, quantity like this one. So the spectrum of anomalous dimension, the structure constant to which you realize this. Now the way of uh, doing uh, is uh, rather than uh, facing directly the uh, problem of finding this uh, quantity through the uh, conformal bootstrap to pass through another route which means uh, understanding what are the algebra and the symmetry which are behind. Now from this point of view, the other time we introduce, the, we prove two things that uh, for what algebra is concerned, analytic and anti-analytic part of any quantity is split it at, at the beginning. At the very end, when I have to construct the physical field, I have to combine the two according to certain principle, which we'll discuss later. But then I can use the splitting of the Z analytic and anti-analytic part to focus my attention just on one of them. From this point of view, we derive the word identity for the primary fields. Primary fields are those which uh, transform as uh, a tensor of uh, degrees delta according to a general conformal transformation. Okay? So for this uh, primary field holds this operator flow expansion. Now this is good for several reasons. First of all, because show that exists at least one non-trivial operator pro expansion explicitly. And you can see that the structure constant here are delta and one, plus others that we'll discuss uh, probably today how to derive. The second thing is that uh, uh, notice that the quantity which uh, the residue is not a residue, but the, the coefficient of the second order pole, essentially, which involves T, is the anomalous dimension of the field you are talking about. Now, you can derive similar operator pro expansion for the stress energy tensor itself. And I told you the other time, the stress energy tensor is a pretty pe peculiar field, is the only special fields, which play simultaneously the role of referee and player because the rule of the conformal transformation, this is the proof, but in itself also participated to the operator flow expansion of the theory, and therefore you can apply to it whatever you have done for others. The only difference is that, that today we understand better is that uh, this guy is not primary. It's going to be quasi-primary, as you will see in a minute. And therefore, the operator pro expansion of the field with itself do not start from second order pole, which is the minimum singularity you can have, but might have also fourth order pole. And the arguing why they might have a fourth order pole is the following. First of all, this guy is a dimension two. And the anomalous dimension this operator can never change in any interacting theory is equal to the engineering dimension. And the uh, reason is that the integral of T is an energy. So it's a well-defined quantity, which is always dimension one. So this guy, in any interactive theory, never renormalized. The anomalous dimension is always two, as you can see from here, second order pole, two. But this quantity, if I sandwich and go to two-point function, of course, is uh, positive defined. And we say the other time that any expectation value of scaling field but the identity is zero. 
So if there wasn't a fourth order pole, you would get a contradiction, a positive quantity which is zero, without any cancellation process in between. Okay? So then the other time we say another important things. The other important things is that any operator for expansion that I'm, I'm writing, I'm going to write, you can equivalently reformulate in terms of a pure algebra. So there is an isomorphism between operator pro expansion relation like this, which involve coordinate and involve morally what happens if I bring two fields together, and algebra in the usual sense of the word. So the way of doing is uh, expressing uh, the fields I'm doing for the stress energy tensor, but it's general, expressing this in mode around one point of analyticity let's say the origin, okay? At this point, the way you define the ln is 1 over 2 pi i integral dz, zn plus 1, tz, as a cauchy Laurent. So this means that if this guy is defined here, you have to make something like this. And then you can ask yourself what happens if you do, say, the commutators. So this is equivalent to do like that, minus inverting uh, the contour. Since uh, point which leave uh, along the two contours are singular in this way, the difference between these things is equal a contour and an integral done on the pole. And from this, you derive that this is n minus m, ln plus m, plus c over 12, n, m squared minus 1, delta n plus m, 0. So I will write here in... Uh, in full glory, because we need it uh, later on. From this point of view, we realized that this is a quantum version of the conformal algebra that we discussed in the first lecture. So the only difference is that there is uh, an extra term which is called central extension over the algebra. Okay? Yeah. Once uh, you define the generator to be an integral, you have to put another uh, contour. So it can be either inside or outside. But once you decide, if I swap the order, you are swapping the order of contour. Simply like that. I mean, there is no mystery, no black magic. It's what it is. do the way you like. The result will be completely indi indif indifferent. The thing is, when you have a contour, you can move it as far as you do not meet singularity. Once you meet singularity, the rule is keep what is the residue inside the singularity, you can move it outside. Simple like that. Why do we need two contours now? Still it's a LN, LM. LN and LM. when the two points coincide. That's not obvious for me. Your problem. <laughs> you work it out yourself. This is not a course of complex analysis. It's a course of conformal field theory based on complex analysis. Now, with the same token, you can uh, work it out others. So tomorrow morning I wake up and say, can I have uh, other examples? Many. For instance, imagine that you have an operator pro-expansion which involves currents. 
So something like kappa delta AB Z1 minus Z2 square plus 1 over Z1 minus Z2 JC FABC plus blah, blah, blah. Okay? So this is an operator flow expansion which involves currents of dimension 1. Why 1? Because you see immediately that on the identity channel, the pole is 2. Now, if you once again expand this guy in, uh, in uh, mode, you repeat exactly the same uh, contour difference as before. What you end up? You end up in uh, JAN, JBM commutator is equal I. F, A, B, C, J, C, N plus M plus kappa N delta A, B delta N plus M zero. Now, for the record, this is called Katz-Moody algebra. So it's an infinite dimensional algebra which involves infinite number of modes, n and m take infinite number of values, and a and b values in a Lie algebra. Okay? So this is called katz moody algebra. You can work it out many others. You can take any operator flow expansion, do the expansion of the field in terms of modes, and rephrasing all operator flow expansion in terms of some algebraic equations. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the, for the question. Yeah, the trick is, uh, the trick is, if you have an operator of dimension delta, is a convention, eh? but is nice convention. When you expand in mode, you always put uh, the delta there. And the reason is, uh, if you do so, the definition which defines the mode is the usual one. Because think, if you don't do, if I didn't do this here, you will have, this guy can be branching, eh? can be any crazy number here. So if you do not as absorb in the expansion of the fields, you are going to get uh, some uh, cauchy loran uh, expansion which are going to be crazy. So another example of this type, and then I finished, and then we continue, is that take uh, fermions. Take uh, Majorana fermions, whose uh, operator flow expansion is this one. Okay? So what I do is uh, sum psi n n z n plus one half, exactly with this, with this rule, and here, what happens if I swap the contour, I'm going to get anti-commutator, not commutators. Is anyone uh, see why? Look, the operator pro expansion contains a lot of information in its simplicity. You see, if I have a simple pole with coefficient 1, if I swap Z1 with Z2, this guy changes sign. So this, fer this field has to be fermions. Okay? So when you do the same trick I'm doing, define the Cn in the usual way, 1 over 2 pi i, contour dz, zn, cz. You will see that doing this trick of taking contour and swapping outside, you have to have plus, not minus. So you get naturally anti commutator So the general rule is operator pro expansion corresponds either to commutator or anti commutator according to the nature of the fields. Okay? Now, that being said, the, the most uh, basic message 
or what I'm done is the following. That we have convert the physical problem of classifying a critical behavior in the mathematical problem of getting irreducible representation of an object that we know to control very well, which is an algebra. This algebra is, however, parametric with C. If you change C, you are changing the algebra. Okay? So you have to, morally, you fix C, and then you ask a reducible representation of this algebra. And when you get it, essentially you have given an explicit realization of what uh, critical theory is. No, with T, with T, with T. What I said is, if you do the operator process, indeed, if you do the operator process function TZ with the current J, this you get 1 Z square J A Z2 plus So the anomalous dimension is the coefficient of the operator plus function with T, not with generic things. Okay? So I hope it's clear really the, the point. The point is we have converted really the hard physical problem to a very specific mathematical problem, which might be difficult, but it's really clear what you have to do. You fix the central charge, and then you get the reducible representation. Say it again, sorry. So there are always two ingredients. There is a test. Let's say it's a test and there is a discrepancy of the Yeah. And compromising the problem with the Yeah. And the L's came out of expanding L2. In the first place, we found No, that. no, no, no. Um, you mean uh, you are referring to the classical? To the classical uh, transformation? So we find the we go to the L's No, no, OK. Look. At uh, that time, I was asking uh, how the conformal transformation act on space of function, ordinary function, answer. You can have an explicit representation in terms of uh, ln equal minus zn plus 1 derivative. Is what you are referring to, right? So it's exactly when you ask uh, what is an explicit realization of the commutation uh, relation in uh, quantum mechanics of function is some differential operator. But I can have in matrix. I can have in other crazy way. Okay? So this was uh, just a specific representation. T does not know anything about the change of variables and right? No, they do. No, no, no. Yeah, but it's what rule it. Indeed, let me just give you an example immediately that also clarify a little bit uh, all the story. Yeah, uh, you will see in a minute. T is not really what, uh, is not doing anything T itself. But if you do a change of variable, the act, which is a general analytic, the action react throwing out in the game T. Because the variation, of, the variation T Enter remember T enter as a response function to the change of metric. So it's like you say if I act a magnetic field, what happened to my system? You have a magnetization. So you cannot ask magnetization does know anything about the magnetic field. It's true in a way, but it's the reaction of the system too. So remember that stress energy tensor is how the the theory react to a change of, of, of variable. 
Okay? So it's like, what is the variation of free energy if I apply a magnetic field? Uh, is the magnetization itself. So this is uh, a field, ordinary function, but this is a field. Okay, and so this is a field, and this is the transformation which play the role of magnetic. No, I mean, if this guy is conform at Mabius, here you get zero, and therefore you are not sensitive to T. So it's like here, if I do not apply any magnetic field, I cannot see the magnetization. True. It's the conjugate field to the when you push the system. It's the response function. I, how shall I say? Of course, the E doesn't do anything itself, but it's how the system reacts if you do something. Okay? So what I want to do now, to clarify a little bit uh, what I said other time, that uh, C is an anomaly, is the following. Imagine that I do an infinitesimal transformation, and then therefore I have uh, So you can work it out that infinitesimally. The stress energy tensor change like this, but there is uh, this uh, extra term, which is the third derivative. Because four order pole, remember the rule is if you have n order pole integrating, you get uh, n plus one derivative of the function. Okay? n minus one, sorry. So this means that. Uh, I take now the expectation values of delta t. This term is 0, but this term is c over 12 derivative 3 over epsilon. So now you understand why it's an anomaly. Because uh, usually, when you have an infinite system, you normalize the ground state energy to be 0 at infinity. Is, a, is something can, I can always do. So the expectation value has to be a constant. It might be infinity. Eh? Some, if you compute it explicitly, in field theory, it turns out to be infinity. But you know it's the same everywhere. So at this point, you can say, I will subtract this constant to be 0. So imagine that I've done these things, that in the plane, I have normalized my stress energy tensor to a expectation value zero. So that the energy, which is the integral, that is zero as well. I make a change of variable in this plane. I map infinitesimally to another one. And then look what happens. What was zero before, now is non-zero. Turns out to have an energy out of nothing just from geometry. And moreover, remember that Mabius was the only transformation that was at most quadratically. So if epsilon was associated to Mabius, zero was before and zero you will have after. But if you do a generic analytic transformation that has third derivative, this will become non-zero. So out of nothing, you get an energy. You know how this is called in physics? This is called Casimir energy. The possibility that you might have a density of energy just coming from geometry. And it's something measurable. In order to do so, we have to work it out. The finite transformation of T under general, general analytic transformation and this involves what is called the Schwarzian derivative. So the transformation of T under general transformation is the following. Let's say T plane is equal T nu, nu in the, means the new geometry, plus... I 
So let me use F. So if you change the geometry, because uh, if you take a, a generic analytic map, the plane is not going to remain a plane. Okay? Imagine for this uh, the logarithmic map, or, uh, mapping the plane into a strip. So under uh, general transformation F, the stress energy tensor transform, if it was like this, was like primary. But there is an extra piece. So the guy is not a tensor in itself. There is something extra. This something extra is measuring the, uh, to say, how much the transformation differs from Mebius. Because if you impose this guy to be zero, imagine that you impose this, this is the differential equation which identifies Mebius. So the other day there was some question from one of you Say, how is Mabius? And then I reply, at that time, will satisfy a differential equation that allow you, if you have not discovered before, to discover after. And so Mabius is the solution to this differential equation. Okay? So this means that the stress energy tensor is a quasi-primary field as far as the Mabius transformation is concerned, because this term is not there. But for generic transformation, is Nothing, in the sense that there is, is a quasi-primary, not a primary field. Okay? Now, you can work it out together with the properties of this Mabius. This uh, Mabius derivative satisfies many interesting properties that I briefly remind, for instance... A uh, Mabius transformation, the new variable, this is going to be exactly equal to the previous one. If you are going to make a Mabius on the variable itself, since everything involves derivative, no surprising, you are going to get uh, Jacobian. And imagine that now that you do a chain of transformation, z going to a new variable omega that go to a new variable u, you can have that u with respect to z is equal to u with respect to omega d omega over dz square plus omega with respect to z. Okay? Now, this transformation is crucial to check the consistency under this chain of transformation, how the stress energy tensor change. So imagine that you first do the first one, and I apply that. Then I do the other one, but I could go directly from one to the other. I can go directly from this to these things. And, of course, I should know the chain of... Uh, Schwarz and derivative, how they compose, in such a way that I will realize that I've done the proper things. Okay? Now, I was telling you the Casimir. So, applying this, uh, I can make the transformation So with this rule, I can compute whatever I want in any geometry because I have everything there. So in particular, 
imagine I take as a function f l over 2 pi logarithmic of z. So this is going to map the original plane into a strip of l l. And then you can compute directly the stress energy tensor on the strip using uh, this transformation. I leave you the exercise to do it. And this is the final result. Therefore, if now I take the expectation value of this, since in the plane the expectation value was zero, because I normalized to be zero, at this point, this is going to be minus pi over 6 divide 6 L squared. Okay, so this means that uh, if I integrated in this direction in order to get the ground state energy, the ground state energy of L will be minus pi C 6 L. So there is a non-zero ground state energy which depends on the geometry. If I take L to infinity, I recover once again zero. But if L is finite, I'm going to have a force between uh, these uh, two sides of this strip. Okay? Now I leave to you to understand if the force is repulsive or attractive. If a Casimir is attractive, so if you put in lab the conformal matter will act squeezing the cylinder or expanding it. Think. Okay, so this clarify the things. And the last things I want to do to clarify the role of C is the following exercise. You might say, Say, so, well, you have done all this beautiful theory as far as C is different from zero. But how do we know if C is not zero? Because if C, if C was zero, we have fully reparameterization invariance. No anomaly whatsoever, nothing. So there is a question. Is it possible really to have C different from zero or you are building up a castle of idea, but at the end of the day, C is zero. So the best way is to provide examples. I can give you two examples where you can compute C explicitly and see that it's different from zero. The first example is free bosonic theory. Of course, massless. Why so? Because uh, when we have a Lagrangian theorem, we have a Nader theorem which allows us to compute the stress energy tensor and not referring to the definition that is the variation to the metric. I have a different route to compute the stress energy tensor. So I take it a Lagrangian, which is this one. With the commutators, sorry, with the propagators. Now you know that co propagators in uh, massless bosonic theory is pretty fishy things. So I don't want to enter now in all the detail. Take this as uh, as definition or compute yourself. I want to say that if you have never realized before. 
massless bosonic field is a really crazy theory. Look that. This guy do not have a disentangle of ultraviolet and infrared divergences. The propagator is singular, both Z infinity, so it seems to be extremely infinitely correlated at infinity, but also Z goes to zero. Moreover, the propagator is not positive defined, while this quantity is positive defined. Okay, so I just point out there are a lot of subtleties here, but this is the starting point you have to do. So T, if you work it out, the analytic component, the stress energy transfer by a Nader theorem, you find that is this one. Okay? Now remember, what is the definition of C is the two-point function of these guys. So the, the only thing you have to do is using this definition, G squared D phi squared D phi squared, and just using Vick theorem. The theory is free. You can compute all this quantity using the propagator and Vick theorem. And the result is 1 half, 1 over Z1 minus C2, 4. Alias, free bosons theory as central charge equal 1. Remember this as a rule of thumb. Okay? We can do another exercise. We can do free massless fermionic theory. Majorana type. So you have an action which is psi de psi plus psi bar de psi bar. You know, fermions in two dimensions has two components, which I choose to be psi and psi dagger, because I've done the change of variable, blah, blah, blah. Psi is only analytic, psi bar is purely anti-analytic. So dz bar of psi is equal to dz psi bar is equal to zero. The propagator is 1 over z1 minus z2, exactly the example I gave before. The stress energy tensor is minus 1 half normal order psi d z psi. And when I compute tt, I have 1, 4, Psi de psi one, psi two de psi two. And therefore you have to do big theorem. You have to do this, 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 minus this, 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 this. Okay? The result what it is one four z one minus z two four. Alias C is equal one half. Say it again. Yeah, look, the, this will uh, be an entire course. <laughs> but the, the real answer is this. Bosonic theory without a mass is really very difficult theory to define properly. So for instance, phi is not a scaling field. The reason you see immediately is because the two-point function is not a power law, it's logarithmic. So this guy is not a scaling field. So it's not, do not even belong to the framework, theoretical framework I'm using. 
Now you say, wow, then we are in a trouble. No, because I can use this field as a building block for scaling fields which are fully defined. For instance, if you take a field which is the derivative of the field itself, this guy you see me as dimension one. If you do the operator flow expansion using these things, you will find it's like the current I was talking to you before. If I take vertex operator, if I take uh, guys which is exponential i alpha phi, if I do two-point function of vertex operator, this is a scaling function of uh, uh, dimension alpha square. So I want to say that uh, massless uh, bosonic fields in itself is a sick theory. It's really sick because, I mean, the, the simplest way of seeing is that this guy is positive defined, but this guy is not. What's going on? Namely, the theory, usually you separate the problem in ultraviolet scale and infrared scale. And the usual approach is ultraviolet I will take care by renormalization of my variable. Infrared I will take care of putting the theory in a finite volume. But here it's not like that. Because you have singularity, both have ultraviolet and infrared at the same time. Exactly at the same time. So you cannot disentangle the two of them. So altogether, in a nutshell, the field is really sick. I mean, but it's not really a disaster because you can use it as, as I said, as a building block, forget about the field itself later, to construct something which on, on the other end are pretty honest quantities. Okay? So here is pretty evident what the problem here is. In fermions, there is no problem whatsoever. So remember just this numerology is pretty important. Bosonic field is equal one. Majorana fermion is equal one half. This number will pop up later. By the way, by under this number, you can also make sense of what people use bosonization. You might have heard that. The possibility of representing a bosons in terms of fermions. It indeed a uh, Complex fermion is just two Majorana fermions that therefore a central charge one because these are energy. C in proper unit is an energy. Energy is additive. If you have two degrees of freedom, is the sum. So two Majorana fermions has central charge one, which is exactly the central charge of a bosons. So at least it's not in contradiction the idea that one boson can be represented in terms of Dirac fermions. And indeed, this is the result of uh, Mandelstam, uh, Coleman, and this and that. Okay? And the possibility of representing fermions in terms of vertex operator. Because I told you this, uh, the anomalous dimension of this guy is alpha square. So if I take alpha square to be one half, this vertex operator is representing a fermions for all property are concerned. It's exactly indistinguishable. Okay? So this is the basic of uh, bosonization. Okay, now we are get familiar with this C. We are getting familiar with the meaning of this C and also the fact that uh, definitely C in at least two systems is different from zero. So, we have to deal with that. We cannot avoid. Okay, now, what I want to do, I want to build up the representation theory of the Virasoro algebra. Okay.
So we'll write here. So the algebra I'm talking about is this one. looking representation space for this algebra. I can, uh, uh, I can uh, do two equivalent fields, things, and the fact of doing that is that each approach has its own advantages. They are completely equivalent, but something uh, is more clear in one approach than the other and vice versa. So the first approach is uh, I'm going to give a representation of this algebra in terms of fields in terms of quantum fields, so things which depend on coordinate, okay? So this means that uh, I will define my stress energy tensor to be around some point. As you understand, you can shift the point where you are expanding freely as far as it doesn't just uh, sit on one of the other fields that you are talking about, okay? So, you have correlation function in general, situated some, somewhere, you expand the fields not just on one of them. Now, I want to define what is uh, the fields so this notation is the following, I have a scaling field A and I want to know what is the fields that I got applying ln to A. So with this notation, I'm denoting, if you want, a new field B. B is what is the field which I got acting on ln on A. Okay? So what is the definition of this? Well, the definition is operative. This is 2 pi i. Okay. So, how I shall interpret this? The way you shall interpret is this guy will have some operator pro expansion which contain power. Multiplying by this one and doing the integral, you are filtering the field which are at the proper power. So the idea is uh, once you have a Fourier mode and you want to filter the M frequency, what you do, you just multiply exponential minus I N theta and you integrate it. This way of doing, filter exactly that component, okay? So the way you have to do it is really what I said. This filter the field you are doing, okay? Now, doing that, we are right to the algebra, okay? Now, is that A of Z1 or Z? Z1, you integrate on Z1, sorry. Oh, okay. uh, no, no, you integrate on... Sorry, what you integrated on. DZ, DZ. You integrated on. So this is Z1, and you integrated on Z. Huh? Eh? On Z1, yeah, sorry. Okay, so with that, listen. Okay, I, you know what I mean. But think is is uh, I can change the variable. I can change point as far as uh, I expand around that. Find something crazy. I expand around this. Now let's compare this with this. Uh, with this uh, expansion. Let's compare. Now, I want to apply this definition I give here to understand what is uh, L0 of 
for a primary field delta. You see immediately, just comparing what I did, that this is just delta V Z. Okay? Now, what is L minus 1 V? This is the derivative of the field. Okay? What is Ln? Is just zero. Is there? Is there? So, the primary field is that field which has at most second order pole. The n pole would be ln phi z n plus two. So you see, since there is no higher order pole here, all the ln, ln positive, annihilate the field. So it's what I said, primary field are those annihilated by all the positive modes. Okay? On the other end, L0 is... Uh, Diagonal, diagonal, so delta is the eigenvalues of L0, and L minus 1 is the derivative. Now, consequences of this is that in any representation, if I have a field phi, automatically in the representation, I shall have an arbitrary derivative of the field. Because definitely I have it directly, but then I can make L1 square. L minus 1 cube, L minus 1 n. So, acting on L minus 1 rep, rep, uh, iteratively, I can get any derivative. So, in any representation built up on phi, among the infinite number of fields, this representation will be done by infinite number of fields, there should be also the derivative. Okay? This is the first consequences. Clear? But of course, how I build up the representation, representation means that I have a vector space such that any operation I'm going to do with the generators, I always get another vector of this space. Nothing is left out. This is an irreducible representation. Yeah. Yeah. And now any other point, yeah, is the same. Sorry, Ellen. I didn't get it. What? What? Yeah. No, 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 it's mode, it's mode expansion, no, 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 no. No, the, the very operative thing. So the way of doing is you take this, you use the operator pro expansion of this guy. So this is a bunch of term with power law. No, no, I'm saying I want to define what is the field which I will get if I act with this ln on some other fields. I have to make sense of this. This is a field, okay? In itself is a field. 
So how I identify these fields? And the rule is filter what is the proper power associated to ln in this operator for expansion. Look, this guy is it's gonna be something like this. A Z one Z one is gonna be I'm I'm just uh, inventing B Z minus Z one to twenty four plus B twenty three fields fields Z minus Z one seventeen plus blah blah blah. And what is your problem? <laughs> yeah. Look, listen what I'm saying. You do the operator pro expansion, I do it, and then I integrate with this power. So what happens is that I filter the corresponding coefficient. Nothing more, nothing less. We can discuss later, but there is no, no mysterious there. First you expand, and then you integrate it. And when you multiply power, you just pick that field. No, no, this is what I'm, uh, I'm uh, doing now. So what I'm saying is, uh, this is general things. This is general definition. If now I apply this definition to the operator pro expansion and work it out before, I realize something uh, nice. I realize that the primary field are those fields which has this property, are eigenvalues of L0. The derivative belongs to the re representation. And moreover, I realized something very distinguished, that the primary field are those which are annihilated by all the other ones. This is the, not the most general thing. Eh? I'm just saying the primary field, if I use this definition, satisfy this one. Capizzi. Yeah, what, what is the problem? Yeah. Guys, there are questions. If there are questions, we discuss. Otherwise, let me go on. Questions? No. Okay, so uh, if I act with, with L minus one, L minus one twice on a primary field, I don't obtain uh, the second derivative. Yeah, you get. And how can I say that? Because the OP is valid for. No, 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 no. Look, if uh, you get this doing L minus one, you have to keep acting. Apply this and you see immediately. Okay. Apply this rule and you see immediately. The question is relevant, I agree. Mm -hmm. But the answer is, uh, if now you take derivative of a field which is not primary, and you want to act on L minus 1, what is the field which come up? What you have to do is, taking the operator pro expansion TZ with the derivative of the field, making the operator pro expansion, do it, filtering, and see that will be second derivative. Okay. So this, is a chain. this is a chain. So the, the, the nice thing is that primary fields, these are very specific of primary, are those which are annihilated by the ln positive. I have to build up a representation. Representation means I have to construct vectors that once I act in any possible way with the ln, I remain in the same space. 
And what are the span of this uh, vector? Are just all possible combinations with negative mode and order in certain way. Okay? So these are the vector space which form an irreducible representation of my algebra. Now, the reason to do the ordering is very simple. So let's understand what is uh, these things. So first of all, all these vectors These are integers. Some of them is some other integers. So this means that uh, my Hilbert space is uh, labeled by uh, space here. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, blah, 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 which are these index n. Because you can prove it immediately using uh, that uh, representation, and in particular L0, L minus N is N, L minus N. You see immediately that if you have an eigenvalues of L0 with dimension delta acting with L minus N, you will get an eigenvalues of L0 or dimension delta plus N. So, means... L minus N acting on a field which I denoted uh, like this. If I act with L0, this is delta plus N. L minus N, the same field. Okay? And the story repeated with all the other LN. So, these fields, therefore, are eigenvalues of L0, and these are the different floor of these uh, things, with the starting point, which is a field of dimension delta. Now, why am I using uh, this ordering? To not overcount my states, because uh, imagine I want to go to the level 3. I can get there making this, this, and this. So L minus 1 cube of the field. This is a field which belongs to this. I can go L minus 1, L minus 2. This is another field. But I could have gone L minus 2, L minus 1. So, a priori, you might think that the level 3 is 3 times the generate. So, there are 3 different fields which correspond to the eigenvalue delta plus 3. It's false. Because one of the two, or including the other one, are linear combination of the other. Sorry, there is also L minus 3. L minus 3, sorry. I can get directly L minus 3. Okay? So, the, the things seems to be four times the general, not three times. However, it's false because uh, what is uh, L minus 1, L minus 2? I can use the algebra. So, L minus 1, L minus 2 is equal L minus 2, L minus 1, plus the commutator. But the commutator is 3 times L minus 3. So you see that L minus 1, L minus 2, apply 20 fields, is equivalent to L minus 2, L minus 1, applied to the same field, plus L minus 3. So this field here, this field here, is linear combination of this and this one. So it's not independent. 
So the, the reason to avoid this overcounting is to build up the reducible representation in terms of ordering a string of integers. Okay? Now, from this point of view, let me do the following exercise. Among the operator progress function, there is the identity fields. It's an algebra, so it should be the identity. The identity field is the boring fields, scaling fields, which I denoted 1 by z, which doesn't depend on z. It's a constant. Okay? It's the identity. But it's a field of dimension 0. What is the L minus 1 of these fields? Of course, it's 0. Because it doesn't depend on anything. But what is L minus 2 of the identity? What kind of field is? I have to use the definition I erased. So this is 1 over 2 pi i integral 1 over z minus omega tz. And here is identity omega. And what it is, amazingly enough, is a stress energy tensor. It's very, very cute things. In this case, yes. But I'm just using the definition I gave you. If I want to know what is the field I got applying a land to something, I have to filter. What is the field, the field which I filter if my initial field is the identity? Stress energy tensor. So the stress energy tensor is not a primary, but is a descendant at the second level of the identity operator. And this explains why it's not a primary field because belong to a second floor of a family whose primary field is zero. Okay? The identity operator in this tower has a anomalous dimension which is zero. Why is zero? Because the field doesn't depend on anything. If I do the two-point function, this is a constant. Therefore, delta is zero. But this is a non-trivial family. There is nothing here. It's the only family which never has a descendant of the first order because L minus 1 of identity is 0. It's the only family which doesn't have the derivative. But the second one is non-zero and is the stress energy tensor itself. So you immediately understand that the a reducible representation of the identity family is built up by all composite operators by stress energy tensor. So our all normal order by T. There is not, nothing else. Okay? But this is pretty cute because you see, once again, that the stress energy tensor is player and referee. And player of very special type is derivative, I mean, is the descendant field. It's not primary. Okay? Now, as I said, the way of counting generically the degeneracy of this level n is through combinatorics. Because you want to know in how many possible ways you can write an integer n in terms of sum or lower index n order it. So it's very specific combinatory problems that has been solved by Hardy and Ramanujan through the following identity. So the degeneracy is this Pn. And uh, asymptotically, 
you can work it out. There is the Abramovitz uh, book, for instance, the last chapter where they derive all the recursive equation for this function and so on. You see immediately why they should satisfy recursive equation. Because if I knew how many states I have here, and I ask how many states I will have to the next level, of course I will have all I got here transport here. But then I get all here in all possible way of going there, which is two in this thing. The n minus kappa times p kappa. So this pn satisfies an obvious recursive equation. P at the level n is equal p to the level n minus kappa times p kappa. And asymptotically, this guy goes exponential. This is the famous formula by Ardi and Ramanujan. No, 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 no. Q is a dummy parameter just to make the counting. It's nothing. Q is Q. It's a dummy variable. It's, uh, okay. Don't like Q, I can take X. It's a dummy variable. Doesn't? It's a sum. It's a sum. Guys, it's a generating function. Generating function use dummy parameters. Because what you have to do is counting the coefficient in front of polynomial series or whatever. It's a dummy variable. Nothing, nothing special with the, with the meaning of exon things. Okay? Look, it's like in probability theory. In probability, when you want to count how many Brownian you have from here to there, extract what is called generating function. It's a function in terms of some dummy variable that if you look the coefficient, it's telling you all you wanted. For instance, in Brownian motion, how you construct a dummy variable is very simple. Imagine you are here. You wait. If you go here, e to the i phi. If you go there, e to the minus i phi. Okay? Do that. And then I generated a function, which is i phi plus e to the minus i phi for n. So this is a function of phi, which is a crazy variable. Phi. Boom. What it is. But if I filter what is i n phi, the coefficient which are there, counting how many times I've gone from the origin to the site n. So this is, for instance, a generating function for the Brownian motion. Phi is whatever. I don't care, because I just use it to count. But the meaning is, is irrelevant. OK? OK, now, what is the most important uh, advantages of using uh, this uh, representation uh, in terms of fields. This is the most, what I'm saying is the most important stuff of all the story. The thing is, let me write down so, all correlation function of descendant fields satisfy linear differential equations. OK? This is the most important stuff of the story. How I prove it is very simple. I have to cancel somewhere here. Let's 
So the content of this, uh, of this theorem is the following. If you have, imagine I have a correlation function of L minus N, some field here, with all the rest. Okay? So this is, a, is an example of a correlation function which involves a descendant field in terms of other primary. So this correlation function is obtained acting with a linear differential operator of order n to this one. Okay? I have to derive what the, the dn is. And in particular, in this case, so there are too many n, m, let's say. So I will, I will derive uh, in a minute for you. So the main message is the following. Once uh, you have uh, imagined uh, for a minute that uh, I'm able to compute correlation function of primary alone, imagine that I know this information, the content of this theorem is that if I want the correlation function which involves descendant fields, this is just the deri derivative quantity. Namely, I can get free just acting with a well-defined differential operators on the set of primary. So from this point of view means that all correlation functions which involve descendant fields are not independent quantity. Clear? Because if I got the primary only, any correlation function which involves the descendants, I can get free just acting with derivative. Example, imagine that you have a correlation function on this primary, and you want to know what is correlation function, the simple one, which is the derivative. What you do? You just take the derivative of the previous one. Okay? Clear? Now, this is a very important consequence because uh, you remember that I prove orthogonality condition between two fields which has different anomalous dimension. So I say that uh, if I have two fields, which in my notation was like this, if they have different anomalous dimension, they are orthogonal. But this implies, for what I say, that all the fields which belong to two different representations are always orthogonal one to the other. So the orthogonality of the primary involves orthogonality of an infinite number of fields built on them. Okay? Now, how to prove this result? This result is very easily proved using word identity. Yeah. N, because uh, I'm using the L minus N descendant. No, no, I have, okay, sorry. The notation is I'm taking the descendants at the level N, L minus N. I have m other points. The differential operator I have to apply to this correlation function 
is a differential operator of order n, built up as a sum of poles on all the others with a proper power. So okay. power is n. 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 The same n which is there. OK? Now, the way of doing or deriving this one is the following. I sandwich the I sandwich the uh, word identity which is there So I'm taking uh, this word identity, valid point by point with the primary, and I, and I take the expectation value. Now, by the way, this expression alone prove already my statement, because T is a descendant of the identity. And you see, the correlation function which involves the descendant of identity is obtained by the correlation function of the primary alone acting with this differential operator. So already this is proven in a way. Okay? But then I do something very tricky. What I do is I do the operator pro expansion of this guy with this one in the following way. is equal So I do the operator pro expansion of this around this in involving the descendant. Now the definition of this descendant, of course, is the integral around the pole omega. So L minus N. L minus kappa phi of omega n is, of course, 1 over 2 pi i integration around the contour Cn times the T that was before. And here, I have to rely on, uh, on theorem of complex analysis, which is the following. I have a function which depends on uh, n plus 1 variable, z, omega 1, omega n. I'm integrating around the pole omega n here. And then there are other plays of singularity of this function. You see explicitly here. Now, there is a theorem in a complex analysis that says the sum of all the residues, including the residue at infinity, is zero. So this means that this integral on this pole is equal to the integral at infinity minus sum of all the individual residue around the other pole. Okay. So originally, I was integrating here to get the descendant, is a definition. But I can compute this integral 
with residue at infinity, which is zero. Because the stress energy tensor at infinity goes like 1 over z4. So it's neglect negligible. So this term is zero, residue at infinity is zero. And then there are the sum of all the pole, the other one. When you do the sum of all, all, all other pole, you get this differential operator I got it there. OK? So you have to do it. If you don't do it, you don't realize all the detail of the story. But the calculation is very straight. So I use the definition of descendant, which are here, in terms of filtering the proper power of the stress energy tensor. So in order to get that differential, that uh, correlation function above, I'm doing this integral. But this integral, I can convert in minus the sum all the integral around all other polar singularities. And the result of that is uh, these differential operators. So the main message is uh, the descendant field you need uh, to build up a representation. But for what dynamics is concerned, they are just algebra. They are just chemistry, how to say. They are nothing basic. Once you have the primary, you have them all. In particular, the structure constant which is there, you need only structure constant of the primary. Why that? Because uh, once you have, uh, remember that uh, we proved uh, the result that uh, the structure constant uh, involving the primary are just exactly the three-point function Remember, this was C123, all Z12, Z13, Z13, with the proper power. When we prove it, this result, we comment that the structure constant, the coefficient that is in front of the three point function, is exactly the structure constant which enter in the operator process function of the primary alone. And then at that time, I said, but what about the others? And then I comment, say, look, they are there. There are infinite number of them. But they are always proportional to these ones. Because imagine that you want the structure constant which involved the L minus 2 of these things. This guy will be some differential operator of order 2 apply here. When you do differential operators, the only thing you are bringing down are bunch or combination of the anomalous dimension. But the result will be, because these guys are linear, will be C123 times a computable function of the algebraic. If you do any other descendants, the result is always the same. The structure constant which involves the descendant fields always proportional to the structure constant of the primary times a polynomial of the anomalous dimension. Hence, if three primary do not talk each other, alias the structure constant is zero, no fields coming from them will talk to any others. Okay? To me, it reminds a very uh, situation uh, very common in Florence at the time of Dante Alighieri, Guelfi e Ghibellini. Nobody talked to any other. Families, they hate each other. And so if the father does not talk to the other father, no child is going to talk to anybody else. Here is the same. If the primary do not talk to each other, all the infinite descendants never talk to others. Never. <coughs> forbidden. Strictly forbidden. Okay? And this comes from this very deep result that all uh, correlation involving descendants 
are got by linear differential operator applied to the primary. The three-point function is select out to spot the structure constant, namely, what are the fusion? If I take two fields, how they are going to fuse here? What is the field which comes from fusing three of them? And the rule is, if there isn't such vertex, here, as intermediate states, can never run any descendants of the field C. On the other hand, if there is the field C, in the intermediate states, there are all the infinite descendants of them. We have to understand what is the meaning of this fusion. Fusion means that you give me two points, two fields, and they fuse to a third one with a structure constant which rule the fusion rule. Okay? So it means A and B can go to C. Then we prove it that this guy which is written there, if these guys are the primary, is exactly the correlation function, is the proportionality of this correlation. Okay? So if this is different from zero, A and B can fuse in C. But then I'm saying if this guy is different from zero, a and B can fuse to an arbitrary descendant of C. Because the structure constant relative to that will be different from zero and computable. Computable to all uh, higher order. So that, there is an uh, exclusion. If it's zero, it's zero forever you will never able to, cap to couple any descendant fields. But if it's non-zero, not only coupled to the father of the family, but coupled to all the, to all the children, everyone. Is, so there are infinite states which run as intermediate states. So it's an exclusive thing. They couple, they couple to all. If they do not couple, they're not to couple to anyone. Okay. So this is crucial because put in perspective this algebra. Because a priori seems that you have to compute an infinite number of structure constant. Remember, the number of scaling field is infinite. Cannot be finite. However, the story now starts to take a shape. The primary, the scaling field organizes in families. So one infinite is gone because one infinite means the infinite number of fields which belong to families. The family might be finite, but the field is infinity because it's the representation. Moreover, the initial problem that you might say, oh my God, I have to compute an infinite number of structure constant, reduce considerably once again because you have to compute only the structure constant involved in the primary because all other organize algebraically. So this is, guys, like lepsch gordon calculation. Eh? You can program your uh, computer in order to compute this polynomial of the delta automatically, because it's just algebra. You have the differential operator, you keep acting on this function. And the result is a bunch of algebraic function of the delta. Say it again, what is the are question? Yeah, so the, the, the statement is any scaling fields either is a primary or a descendant of some primary. There is no way out. No, because I'm building up a reducible representation. These are the only, the all and only representations. Uh, what you want uh, less. It's like, uh, can exist a spin a square root of pi? No. Because if you do the representation theory of SU2, you find that they are organized in spin which are integer of half integer. So there is no rule for square root of pi spin. 
It's at the same level. I have an algebra, and I'm asking and I'm looking for irreducible representation of this algebra. That's it. So. Nothing, just the descendants of uh, uh, are those ones, quasi primary, are those which are, uh, uh, thanks for the question, is a, is a nice question and deep one. So imagine that you have some set of field here for, uh, for uh, I label A1, A2. Imagine at this level you have this set of fields. Now you ask, what are the sets which live to the next neighborhood? Well, trivial ones are all the derivatives of these fields. Trivial. Means I'm using all L minus 1 to transport these states here. But here, there might be more fields than that. So the quasi-primary at the level N are the fields cosine n minus 1. So are all that fields at that level which are not derivative of any one before? These are the quasi-primary. And are still primary. Yeah. No, 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 no. They are descended. Uh, quasi-primary means that they are not derivative of anyone else. No, 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 no. L minus 1. So you find them at the level, and they are those. Guys, in this uh, game, there are many operators. Many. L minus 1, L minus 2, L minus 3. L, mi L minus 3 is not a derivative operator. It's not. Okay. So that would have come from L minus 3, you're saying? For instance. Okay. For instance. Okay? As not to be derivative of any, anything else. Okay? L minus 1 is very selected, the operator, just the derivative. So, but L minus 2, so this is the reason why the level 2, you have L minus 1 square of a field, L minus 2 of a field. This guy is second derivative of this, but this is not the derivative. Is something else. Okay? So, derivative fields are those that you coset if you want to, to have the genuine new field which appear at the next level. Okay. So, this is uh, the representation theory done on fields. And as I said, the, the main advantages of this is that we got this stunning result and this stunning understanding that fields, scaling organizing families, structure constant are always proportional to the structure constant of the primary, and once more, the building block of all the theory are correlation functions of primary alone. So if we are able to pin down the correlation function of primary, we have done in a, in a nutshell, okay? Now, I want to build up now representation theory in terms of states. Remember, I have a states defined in this way. I take my primary field delta. I have a vacuum state, which is the only state on which any observer will agree on and L0 of this is 0, L1 of this is 0, L minus 1 of this is 0. Of course, this is, came from the identity family. Okay? So this is the way of defining states in conformal field theory. I told you that you can define the bra limit.
By the way, uh, when I derive the stress energy tensor and transformation very often and so on and so forth, you understood uh, that L0 played the role of Hamiltonian on the cylinder. So if you look at the calculation we've done at the beginning of the lecture, going from the stress energy tensor on the plane to the cylinder, remember that was a st stress energy tensor on the cylinder is equal to z squared t on the plane minus c over 24. So on the cylinder, you can write down immediately the conformal Hamiltonian, which is the following one. So this is R. This is the conformal Hamiltonian, which act on all the states on the cylinder. So I, you will have a very specific form for the Hamiltonian. Okay? Close, open and close parentheses. So from this point of view, I can define the bra, taking out the evolution through the Hamiltonian of the my states. And this is the way of doing it. So that being said, I define my Hilbert space of states. Now, I have uh, the, uh, the states given delta. I have, uh, once again, the same family as before. The only thing represented the difference. So this is delta. This is L minus 1 delta. This is, I have L minus 1 squared delta and L minus 2 delta, and so on and so forth. Okay? Now, when you have an Hilbert space, the natural question to ask is scalar product. So, can I compute scalar product in this uh, theory? Very, very simple. I just have to use the algebra. So, for instance, I normalize this to be 1. What is the norm of L minus 1 delta? I have to define the dagger. What is the dagger of uh, the ln? And the, the way of proving is, uh, once again, coming back to the original definition of the stress energy tensor in Lorentzian space, making all the dagger there selecting out the mode, and since it's a real field, you end up in a condition like this. So it's like uh, when you're doing Fourier mode that phi kappa dagger is equal to phi minus kappa. Yeah, yeah, exactly like that. Nothing more, nothing less. But I just want to say I have the dual. So then, this is my norm, okay? How I can compute this norm? Very simple. Because I have an algebra which allows me to swap this. So this is equal L1, L minus 1, L minus 1, L delta, plus 2, delta, L0, delta. Okay? I'm using this algebra. This is a primary field, so are annihilated by all the positive mode. So this term is zero. And it's this. So what is this norm? It's two delta. Okay? Now, you can build up matrices, which in mathematics term are called gram matrices. So let's go to the level two. So level two I have uh, these states. I have delta L minus 2, L, sorry, L plus 2, L minus 2 delta, delta L 1 square L minus 2 delta, delta L2 L minus 1 square delta. Clear? 
because at the level 2, I have as a, as a vector L minus 1, L minus 2, delta. And therefore, I'm computing all the scalar product between them. Now, this is an amazing, uh, interesting exercise that you can program on your computer because the only thing you are doing is any string I gave you, so morally, any scalar product is a string like this. In which the sum on n is equal to the sum on m. Because I'm on the same level. Otherwise it will be zero automatically. Okay? So how to compute to reduce this matrix element to something endable? Well, the only way to do is commute, 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 until you arrive to L0. And once you arrive at L0, delta. And there, this is some polynomial of delta and the central charge. You can program. It's, it's a bit, uh, it's very interesting program of computer science, how you do this commutator using this algebra, because it's recursive. So each time you say, did I arrive to L0? No, keep going. Did I arrive to L0? No, keep going. Until you convert to everything like that. So if you do this exercise here, the answer is very simple. You can compute immediately. So the matrix is 4 delta plus C half, 6 delta, 6 delta, 4 delta, 1 plus delta. OK? Look, this is particularly simple. L2, L minus 2, if you swap it, is 0. And what is the commutator? Will be 4 times L0. This is the 4 delta. But then, there is the central term. And therefore, you get 4 delta plus C half. OK? Now, this is, in general, what this matrix is. So as far as the determinant is different from 0, these states are independent. So you have linear space of dimension 2. The angle is not orthogonal. There's some angle between them, but is independent. Now, let's ask a very subtle question. Can exist uh, by chance some crazy number or crazy condition between the central charge? Remember, central charge is a free parameter. Delta is a free parameter. But can exist uh, by chance some crazy relation between C and delta, which make this uh, linear space not made by two, but just by one vector? Namely, can exist a null vector at that level? Eh? So what you have to do is, uh, of course, computing the determinant and finding the root. So computing the determinant is a polynomial of order 3. I will write down in full glory. It's just uh, algebra, eh? nothing else. The polynomial is 6 minus 10 delta square plus 2 delta square times C plus delta C. You see that I can factorize this as delta times is order 3. Let me denote it, the root this polynomial in this uh, crazy way. OK? It's a polynomial of order 3. You see immediately that uh, delta equals 0 is a root. So delta 1, 1 is 0. Has to be there? Of course, yes. Because uh, Remember the structure. 
when I'm uh, here, I can go up, just apply the corresponding operator, which bring me up. I just uh, show you before that the norm of this guy is precisely 2 delta. Therefore, I'll, at the level 1, I add a null vector as far as delta is 0. But if I have a null vector at this level, I can move up at the second level just applying L minus 1. So this means that the fact that this polynomial has a root which is delta equals 0 is nothing else that reflecting the fact that there was a null vector at the previous level. Okay? But then there are some extra things. What are the things? I can work it out. And this is 1, 16, 5, minus 6, plus and minus, 1, minus C, 25, minus C. Okay? It's a second order equation. You got this, and now start playing with numerology. Say, do I know any system where I know the central charge? Yes, the fermions. Plug here, C equal one half. What you get? Delta one, two. I don't know which one of the two. We can work it out is one half, one, two, one, is one, sixteen. What I want to say is, if I plug here, C equal one half, and I ask, what are the primary field which has a null vector at the second level? The answer is, the primary field which has dimension one half to one sixteen. Now, you might not be excited, but if you knew Baxter by hand, you know that these numbers are the number of easy molar. These are the anomalous dimension of the magnetization field and the Majorana field that exists in easing. Okay? So I'm just saying, just play with numerology. In this case, you get something very, very suspicious. Alias, that exactly for the central charge of a fermion, and you know that these correspond to a Majorana fermions, asking this very innocent question, realized that the system tells you that there are two distinguished fields which has a null vector at the level two. What does it mean, this? It means something incredible. The something incredible is once you have a null vector which is zero, you know exactly what is the expression which is null vector. And in this case is, uh, keep in mind this that will uh, will uh, enter in middle in a second. The null vector which is uh, associated to these uh, values are. So if you work it out, what are the linear combination between the two vectors which are zero, is this one. So this guy is really zero fields. Okay? The norm of this guy is zero. The space is positive definite is zero. But this means that if I insert this in any correlation function, imagine I insert this in any correlation function, for instance, involving the same field itself, this guy has to be zero. But I just told you before 
that any descendant is a differential operator. So you get a stunning result that correlation function of these fields satisfy linear differential operators. So the four-point function of uh, fields which are degenerate, so delta is one of the, these two values, satisfy linear differential operator of order two that, as we work it out this afternoon, will be hypergeometric differential equation. Hypergeometric differential equation, there are thousands of books around. So means that you can get out all possible correlation functions of this system solving just hypergeometric equation. Okay? Hypergeometric equation as coefficient, which are gamma function. When you go to the limit, you get the value of the structure constant. So the value of the structure constant at the end of the day will be bunch of gamma function. Highly non-trivial numbers, absolutely highly non-trivial. You, you could not have guessed a priori. But this comes precisely from this structure that exists primary field which has null vector at a certain level. Here I'm just presenting you the simplest one. But the story is I can get for you null vector at arbitrary levels. So the result is that correlation function of this primary field satisfy an infinite number of linear differential equations. Linear, this is important. Because linear, everything is linear. It's a linear space, you can combine, you can make linear combinations, blah, blah, blah. But doesn't mean that the equations are trivial, not at all trivial. But they are linear, okay? And this is the simplest example, an hypergeometric one, okay? Yeah. No, no, delta is this. It's this. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, if uh, you are imposing a null vector equation, you are imposing this polynomial to be zero. You have two roots apart of the trivial one. If delta is in relation with C in these values, the corresponding null vector is this one. It's a very linear, very specific linear combination of the two fields, L minus two, L minus one square, and this is it. Given that, and given that this is the null field, and by the fact that I proved it before that any descendant field is essentially a differential operator linear, automatically implies that all the primary fields which satisfy a null vector condition are solution of linear differential equation. Which depends parametrically on C. Yeah, 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 it's true. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, we stop here. And this afternoon we proceed with this story because this is really the crucial part of the, of the theory. Okay?